If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. Uh, while you're turning there, I did talk to Matthew a little while yesterday, and all the plans are underway, and he will actually arrive Thursday at 4.30. Love to be driving in Nashville at 5. Uh, but, uh, uh, and then he'll stay, he and um, Odessa will stay Thursday night, Friday night, and we have to have them back at the airport at 2 on Saturday. But uh, so he will get to be with us a little while, and none of the girls are coming, so I'm sure that'll be lonesome for Dessa, but maybe it'll be good to be away for a little while too. So everything looking good for that. Gospel of Luke chapter 15, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Luke 15, in the first verse, the Bible says, Then drew him, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners. For to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice for me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven, for heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for everything that you do to our, for our church, Lord. We pray this morning that you'd be lifted up in what we say and we do. We pray that you would make your word a living word because we know that's not in our abilities but relies on you. God, we pray for that and we pray that you would meet with us and we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, I'll be preaching uh, on the thought this morning, why are we still attacked? Have you ever wondered why after you're saved, it seems like the devil bothers you more than before you were saved? Uh, that he hinders you more and that he uh, tries to bring you down more. And I'll give you a very simple under uh, explanation. And as we go along, uh, I think you'll understand he don't know what salvation is about. That is the reason why he really believes like many false doctrines today that salvation can be mired or messed up or ruined and that he doesn't know, understand that it's eternal. He doesn't understand that it's ever existing. He, he doesn't understand that it's far more powerful than he himself is. So attacks continue to come. Now on the side note, and you can look at this this week, many people believe that just like Satan. Free will Baptists believe that. They believe that uh, Satan can come along and steal from you. So uh, that it, it's hard to uh, reconcile that with faith, is it not? And so we find that as the Lord Jesus begins to deal with some Jews, he explains the rejoicing that we ought to have. <clears throat> In the first verse, he says, Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear them. Now, uh, I think it's interesting that this is a mixed bag of followers. We find the publicans, which are self-righteous Jews that are law carriers that pay attention to detail of the law. And then at the flip side, we have open sinners that were coming to him collectively. Now, let me give you a refresher course. You're still a sinner. You know, you know what the redeemed are? They're saved sinners. This has not been changed yet. 
And, and so you will fight that battle every day. Now, is it a fight for redemption? No. It is dealing with Satan and dealing with this flesh day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, until we finally give it up. That, that, that is the state of man. Now, uh, I believe, and this is my own opinion, both this bag of people, the Pharisees and the, and the sinners, were all one group. They were lost. Now, the Pharisees thought themselves a little bit more of themselves than the, the sinner sinners did, but they were all sinners. The, the law had no value to redeem. All it did was write out, if you do this, this, and this, you are, in fact, a sinner. Uh, I think Paul said, it's your schoolmaster. It teaches you what sin is. It teaches you about sin. And, and so as they come, we find two groups of sinners, one thinking that they are better than the other group, but yet and still all sinners. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now, this eating type of fellowship, the Lord was crisp, uh, criticized time and time again for this sharing of a meal. Uh, if you remember, he was criticized for sharing a meal uh, with Lazarus and his two sisters because of their reputation. And the reason why in the Jewish culture that's a very, that, that's a very uh, close time. It is a time uh, where the, the Pharisees had made it a, a situation where you had to wash your hands three times during the meal. And, and had made it something that it wasn't. And so he, he, uh, he was being criticized for it. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Now, I want you to see that if you've genuinely been saved and you've truly been born again, Jesus came and saved you. It was not the flip side. It was not under the, uh, under, uh, under the opposite circumstances. You didn't come to Christ. Christ came to you. And, and that salvation that you can take out here to the lot beside the church and, and be, and be very, very full confident in that, because, you know what, the only reason a person seeks Christ is because Christ is already seeking him. That is the only reason. And, and so we see that certainly we would do the same. We would leave the fold in its own care, if you will, and go after that one that's lost. Uh, verse 5. And when he found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that which was lost. I say unto you, likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons that need no repentance. Now, I want you to see that there is rejoicing in heaven over one person that's saved. You ever think about that? What, what a party there must be in glory when one individual is saved. And, and you know what? They understand that. Satan and his crew do not. Have you ever been trying to witness somebody uh, to somebody and you just get that blank stare and you think, they don't understand a word I'm saying. And you know what? You're right on point. They don't understand a word you're saying because they're blinded and, and they've never been made alive again. And, and, and so we find then, not only are they blinded to it, they have no equipment to understand it and, and to grasp the truth that is involved in that. And, and so here we find, but in glory they do. 
The devil does not understand spiritual things. He does not understand that God is always and always will be the omnipotent winner to all things. He does not understand God. You know, as minute as our understanding is of the person of Jehovah, Satan understands less. That, that is very hard for us to, to comprehend, but it, it is certainly just that way. Now, to give you a refresher course, go back to me uh, to the book of Job in the, the first chapter. Uh, Job, uh, I believe, was a saved man in the sense of the Old Testament, and I, I think pretty much grace for grace that it's always been a move of God to save someone, uh, but Christ did not yet offer the atonement. Uh, Job chapter 1, beginning in verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. Now, I want you to notice two things I've pointed out to you many times. First of all, Satan is under the authority of God. And if he said, Satan, jump. The only response Satan can come up with is how high do you want me to jump? Because he's under, he's under that authority. And the second thing I want you to notice is where he was at before they called this meeting that he had to attend. And that is the earth. Going to and fro, up and down, looking for a vulnerable victim. Now, you ever thought, who is the vulnerable victim? Lost people, it's not you. He doesn't have you. It's me, and you, and you. And you know why? Again, he doesn't understand the workings of salvation, and he really does believe he can bring you down. He really does believe that he can make you unsaved, if you will. And, and so that's what his constant thing is, and certainly didn't understand the character of Job, and didn't understand Job's situation at all, and so his accountability to God caused him to go to this meeting, verse 8, and the Lord said unto him, Satan, has thou considered my servant Job? There's none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. So I want you to see as the dialogue begins, it is God that says, you look at that testimony. You look at how he's following me. You look how he intervenes on behalf of his children in prayer. You, 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 you look at, at the wealth that he's got because he's followed me. Now, does he still do that? Well, I think he still does. That's my own opinion. And uh, I don't think he probably has ever done it for me because I'm not, I don't know that I've ever been spiritually successful as Job was. But I do believe he still does it. And I do believe these meetings probably still transpire uh, whenever God has the notion to call people in. Verse 9. This was Satan's summation. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and in his substance, and his substance is increased in the land. Put forth thine hand. Now and touch all that he had, and he will curse thee to thy face. Now, I want you to see that, that Satan begins to, to show his ignorance of spiritual things. He begins to show his stupidity when it comes to the redeeming grace of God. Because what was his idea concerning redemption? What was his idea uh, concerning Job's 
uh, faithful service to God. It was about things. You know, I've met, I've met a few people like that, haven't you? That thought the only reason that you served the Lord is because you were blessed. In other words, Satan had no understanding, none whatsoever, about salvation. He thought it was all a game. He, he thought it was the only reason that Satan, the only reason that Job was serving is because he had some stuff. And you know what? I see that a lot in the modern day. Uh, look, look at these crazy TV evangelists saying, if you serve the Lord, you're going to get a million dollars. You know what? That's Satan's understanding of salvation. And, and so we see that uh, also that Satan says, you take everything he has. And, and, and why do you suppose he said you take it? That's exactly right. He didn't have the ability to do it. But uh, we do find that God said, take everything you he has, but you can't take his life. Right. Still, under the feet of Jesus. So we find that, uh, that Satan has no understanding of spiritual things. So he will continue time and time and time again to bring you down to nothing. Now, we know at the end of this, at the end verse, it says, uh, in all this, Job, uh, well, no, that's at the end of chapter 2. At the end of this chapter, uh, the Bible says that he stripped his clothes off and said, uh, naked come, came I into this world, and naked I will go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job sinned not. So all that attack, and there would be a second attack that's coming. Why, why did he put that energy out? Why did, why did Satan do that? Because he don't understand salvation. The, the, that's something that comes from God. That's God's sovereignty. You lost people, you know what, one day when it clicks with you, what that is, that's the work of the Almighty. That's Him doing the work of redemption in your life to begin to understand some spiritual things, to begin to understand, hey, I'm in desperate need of a Savior. Satan and his cohorts do not have that ability. Now go with me back to the Gospel of Luke, this time in chapter 4. Uh, Luke chapter 4. In the very first verse, now we understand the, the knowledge of Satan and we find that he attacks Christ. And, and, and you think in your mind, you know, how could this how could he be so stupid to attack the Son of God? He really does not understand spiritual things. Really, I have to say that most angels, I would say all angels don't. That's why our praising him it is more noteworthy than the angel praising him is because they being created beings and we being human we, we praise him more because think about this. Think about a dog. And uh, uh, we, uh, we have two dogs, one of them in the house, one of them outside the house. And, uh, uh, Sarah's little dog uh, is in the house. She's not the smartest dog I've ever met. Uh, but she, she knows her name and she'll do some things. And what she does do, and the understanding she does have, is the understanding of a dog. You know what I'm saying? Now, Sarah can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think uh, uh, she know. If you say said, I think she's just going to look at you. Uh, I don't think she can follow that command. But if you say, hey, it's time to eat, she'll come running. And she understands that. But does that make her a person? No. She's following our commands. Right? 
Same thing with angels. If the Almighty says, angels, let the coronation begin. Their only, their only option is to start singing. Michael, you go tell Mary that she's going to have my baby. No option. He immediately went. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and that being uh, different, and that is what Lucifer was, he thinks all beings are this way. He thinks every created being is just on God's command. You see what I'm saying? And, and, and so we see what we do then is for... So his attack on Satan is out of his own ignorance. In the first verse, in Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost, and let me... Say as an aside, uh, if, if, if Satan ever comes your way, you better be hoping you're running on full. Now, I don't know if I shared y'all with this because I'm really used to be really, really bad about running my car low on fuel and the girls would be all weirded out when they got in, especially Sarah and my daddy because someone gets some gas. And, you know, I was like kind of laughed it off until... I can start my car with my keychain. I started my car one morning because it was cold outside. And you know what happened? It ran out of gas. And we don't have we don't prime carburetors in 2024. You burn out fuel injections. But thankfully the Lord was with me, and the fuel injection did not burn out. But with that said, you don't want to face Satan with an empty tank. Uh. And, and I'm afraid a lot of times we do. And then we wonder, hey, why was it this bad? And so we find that being in his ignorance and not understanding being a free agent and being able to praise God as we will if we are saved beings, he even attacks Christ. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. That was after his scriptural baptism. And he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being 40 days tempted of the devil. Now, I want you to see the, the wording there. And I'm not saying either one is wrong and more right than the other. But if you read Matthew's account of the very same event, it says that, he uh, fasted 40 days and afterwards was a hungered, and then Satan showed up. But I want you to see in, in Luke's account of the very same event, apparently he worried him the whole time. And me, I think, knowing Satan's character as well as anyone, I think he worried him every day. Oh, let's go ahead and eat something. I know you're hungry. Ever come that way? First of all, if you've never fasted, truly fasted, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you have, the devil wants to compromise that. And you know why? Because you made a commitment to God. I'm not going to eat for 24 hours. I'm going to study the things of God. And he wants you to break that commitment. And, and, and so we find that... Uh, in his ignorance, the devil fights him and fights him and fights him and fights him. Now, verse 4, uh, excuse me, verse 2, being 40 days tempted of the devil, and in those days he did not, he did eat nothing, and when they were ended afterwards, afterward hungered, and the devil said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, command these stones to be made bread. And Jesus answered him, said, It is written that Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. And the devil taking him up into a high mountain and shewed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment. And the devil said unto him, all, all this power I will give unto thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, get, by, get thee behind me, Satan, 
For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And, and so we find the devil even attacks the living Son of God. In his ignorance, in his, in his lack of knowledge, of spiritual knowledge of God, he come, and he come in and attacks the Son of God. And so what exemption do you have? Right? If he don't understand the security of the believer, and he didn't even recognize that he couldn't bring down the Son of God, what are you? He'll try to get you. He'll try to bring you down. He'll, he'll try to discourage you. And he certainly will try to get you to quit. Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't even count in 30 years of ministry, or will be in October, how many times that he said, Larry, well, just don't attend. Nobody's listening to you anyway. You know, uh, sometimes you get those blank looks over everybody in uh, the congregation. And I guess you don't if you've not been on that side of the pulpit. But you ever wonder, I think it's two things. Number one, it's your percept it's my perception. It doesn't mean that no one's listening, but I can take it that way, right? Mm -hmm. And what does it become? It, it becomes a tool right. for Satan. Right. And he said, quit, Larry. Why have you done this for years? And so we find that I'm not exempt, you're not exempt, you're not exempt, you're not exempt. That we all are constantly attacked by Satan. Now, with that said, let me say this. I don't even know if he sends an imp your way. Do you know why? Because I don't know how well we serve him to start with. Now, uh -huh. he goes to himself to the big dogs. Remember Legion? I was reading somewhere this morning uh, where out of Legion's, I think uh, in Mark's gospel maybe, it's, it's described as hundreds of thousands of demons in legion or devils. And if that was present, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of devils out there That's right. yeah. looking for you. Mm -hmm. Now, now remember, why, why aren't the attacks going to the lost? He doesn't have some. Uh -huh. And if he's ignorant of the perpetuity of the saints, why wouldn't he attack you? He thinks if he can defeat you, you are now his. He really is that dumb. So he'll keep attacking you and keep attacking you and keep attacking you. And if he brings you to your knees... Does it mean you're lost? No. But it'll be a whole lot of discouragement to you. <clears throat> Ever thought down through the years how many people have come and gone to the New Testament church? Remember the Moors? Yeah. And you remember the Pendells? Remember Sister Pat? I'm not embarrassed about saying names with that. But I'm just saying, what do you think about me? Now again, being attacked by Satan. Satan comes to me, Larry, what could you have done differently? Did you say something wrong? Were you a little too severe? That's an attack. And you know, when, when I'm strong in the spirit, I'll say, no! I preach the word of God, and it fell where it fell. And that is true, right? Mm -hmm. But other times, I'm like, pews are getting pretty empty. <laughs> right? 
Were we ever to be head counters to start with? No. You know who started that? It was a bunch of Methodists. <laughs> Remember the little brag board we used to have? We don't need that, right? The little as we are, I know who's here when anyway. <laughs> I mean, at the count heads. So, where is he attacking you? Because I believe genuinely, if you're saved, that he is attacking you. And if he's not attacking you, you may not be, be being as effective as you think you are. So, either he's attacking you, one of his imps are attacking you, or you're not doing enough to make a difference either way. Right? And, and so we find, lastly, in Ephesians... Ephesians chapter 6, very familiar verses of Scripture, but hopefully this will put it in more clarity of light. Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, who would also be mentioned in the Revelation, very effective church, a church that at least at this time loves souls. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, the Bible says, well, let's read verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. You know, if that's the statement, brethren, be strong in the Lord, the flip side has to be true, too. You can be weak in the Lord. Strong and, I mean, saved, yes, but weak in the things of truth, weak in your life for Christ, weak in a lot of uh, a lot of different ways, but I want you to Paul said the best medicine. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Now, we know Satan is coming now, and now we even know why. Because he doesn't understand that you're saved for eternity. So my question is he's coming? When is he coming? And more than that, are you ready? Right? So, Paul tells the church at Ephesus, put on the whole armor because the battle's coming. He's coming with the belief that he can take you down and get your soul back, as absurd as that sounds to us or who are sovereign grace, that's what he believes. Put on the whole arm of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles, and that word also means methods, of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, I want you to see every one of those ends with an S. You say, well, Larry, why is that significant? <laughs> well, back to second grade, S means plural. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't have one while. He has hundreds of wiles. Right? He doesn't have one mode of discouragement. He has tens of thousands modes of discouragement. Because you know what would discourage me may not discourage you. Now, most of you who are close to me know that when I try to do something real specific now, this hand trembles. It's part of my brain issue. And sometimes even just when I'm feeding myself, uh, it, it will really start doing this. Now, used to, years ago, and this shows my pride, maybe my Lord did. <laughs> if somebody wanted blood drawn or an IV started, they called me. I was known as one stick. And uh, uh, now it's a little more difficult. And you know what? Sometimes when I try to start an IV and I miss... Satan says, why don't you just stop? You're an old man now. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Now that wouldn't mean anything except maybe Donna. But it means something to me. So he has tens of thousands of things 
just that will work for me and that will work for you and that will work for you and all knowing who we are. And he'll bring us down with him. That, that, that is his method. So the question is, are you ready for those events to transpire? Are you ready for him to come your way? Verse 13, we're going to close. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that, you may, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Now, I have that underlined in my Bible, because, see, it doesn't say having done all to make advancements. Having done all to see souls saved, just to stand and hold the line. <clears throat> so what does that mean if you're not ready? If he knocks you flat on your back? Now, when I was little, when I was young, I was very tiny. And so to compensate for that, I was very scrappy. I don't even remember this happening, but my brother had a big pee haul about it one day. And there were these folks back home named Little John was their last name. The youngest one was me and me and Donna's class in high school. And they all came over, about six boys and two girls. And all the boys came over, and uh, this one that was the youngest, I won't say his name, he's, he's passed away now. And uh, he came up to me and started smarting off. And I, like I said, I, I could have been more than four or five, and James said, I just went, boom, and knocked him down, his teeth started bleeding, and, uh, but you know what, that's, that's how Satan does us, are you ready for it, he will punch you in the mouth before you realize it, that's right, and after I knocked Christy down, his boy turned to him and picked him back up, yeah. But the damage was already done. No, these boys were mean. They didn't run to his side to encourage him. They're like, you useless. Because <laughs> he, in their eyes, he should have got the first punch. You see what I'm saying? Same way with us. When we're flat of our back, who do you think the devil goes to? That one's supposed to be yours, and I brought him down. <laughs> Pretty rough, ain't it? So we, as Lord's people, we need to understand his character. And the summation of the whole thing, save people, he's coming for you. Now, he thinks he's bringing you down to being lost again. But what it ended up being is a discouragement on your pastor and on your family. Mom and dad saying, what could I have done differently? Your pastor saying, how did I offend them? All those things transpiring. The devil, Satan thinking he's getting a victory. And all these ripple effects that's happening in the church. So what about you? Do you have your armor 